if you've got a Bible there, please, a collection of ancient documents. <laughs> Very, you like that? I got burnt this morning. Burnt by Sarah Gray for misquoting myself. Um, if you've got a collection of ancient documents there, can you turn with me this morning to Matthew uh, chapter 11? Matthew chapter 11. I want to kind of continue on a little bit in the direction we've been going, speaking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, yeah, I made a statement last week, and I just want to draw our attention back to that again. Uh, last week I said if we build our lives on the basis of what we think God won't do, instead of building it on what God could do, then we'll never see what God wants to do. Okay? If we build our lives on the basis of what we think God won't do, there are a lot of things that we just assume upon God. Is that right? There are a lot of assumptions that we make about God. We assume that God, uh, depending on, on your circumstance and situation, there are a lot of assumptions you make. You assume that God might not be interested in this part of your world. Or we assume that God might not be interested in, in bringing healing or wholeness or help to this part of the world. We assume that this is just my lot in life and it's never going to change. We make a lot of assumptions when it comes to God. And, and if we build our basis on what we think God won't do, all these things we think he won't do, instead of actually building on what he could do. I'm not saying he will. I'm not giving a guarantee saying God will do everything, but, but there's a lot of things that we know God is capable of doing, and that lot of things could probably be summed up in the word anything. Amen? Anything. God can do amazing things. Who believes that today? Who believes that God can? I'm not promising you he will, but I'm saying who believes that God has the capacity, capability, and power to do anything that he wants? Who believes that this morning? I believe that. I believe God can do whatever he wants to do. And if I build my life on my, on my understanding of what God could do, what is possible, then I create a space in my world where God is then able to do what he wants to do. If I go back to Nazareth, when Jesus is in his own home, in his own village amongst his own people, he could do nothing because in that place they were so familiar with him and they didn't have any faith. There was nothing that he... It didn't say in the, in the language there, it doesn't say that he didn't want to do any great works. It says that he couldn't. There was something, whether I like it or not. How many of you know there are things in this collection of ancient documents that, 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 that I don't like? Anyone like me? There's just stuff in there I hate it. If I was writing it, I would take it out. If God said to me, Alan, you can come up with the new Alan translation, the NAT, I'll tell you what, she'd be a shorter read. And there'll be a lot of things taken out of that version because I don't like them. But just because I don't like them, or even just because I don't understand them, doesn't mean they're not saying something to me. And it doesn't mean it's not true. And even the things that make me uncomfortable about God are true. Amen? So if we build our lives on the basis of what we think God won't do, then we're going to pretty much restrict who God is in our mentality. Instead of building up what God could do, which should broaden our understanding of God, and if we broaden our understanding of God, we create a bigger space in our world for God to do the things that he wants to do. Things he wants to do. Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 to 6. Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, when John had heard in prison about what? The works of Christ, right? When John had heard in prison the stuff that Jesus was doing. So John's in prison at this point and he's hearing. Whether people are coming in to visit him and so on, he's hearing. Hey, did you know Jesus is now doing this and now doing that and teaching this and saying that and healing this and delivering this. And he went into a synagogue and he challenged the leaders and he healed a leper. And, and, and he's hearing all the things that Jesus is doing. It says, when he heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? That seems strange to you. It seems strange to me. Because if I go back a few chapters earlier on in Jesus' ministry, there's a picture of John the Baptist, that the, and he's standing at the rivers and he's baptizing all these people, right? And then what happens is, is he's telling them, you know, one, one, one greater than me is going to come. Dunk up. Someone better dunk. By the way, Jesus, dunk. Dunk. And then all of a sudden, if you read it in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you read it in these accounts, we get this picture of a few things that happened that seemed pretty secure for John when it came to who he thought Jesus was. God said to him, you're going to see somebody and the Spirit's going to descend upon them and stay upon them. Right? He's going to see something spiritually. I wasn't there. But he knew. God said, the one whom the Spirit descends upon and stays, he's the one. So John had seen something descend upon Jesus and stay, a confirmation, this is the one. 
He was so confident that as Jesus walked through the crowd, John declared to the crowds, everyone, this is the Son of God. This is the one. He boldly declared to the crowds of people waiting to be baptized, this is the dude. This is the guy. This is the Messiah. This is Jesus. The Spirit came upon him. Then it says that there was this loud voice. They heard this loud voice. This is my, in whom I am. I love that passage. I love the fact that the Father wanted to say to Jesus publicly before Jesus had ever done anything. You're my son and I love you. I'm not going to love you more when you start healing the sick. I'm not going to love you more when you start raising the dead. I'm not going to love you more when you start preaching with power, authority and wisdom. I'm not going to love you more because of what you did. I don't love you because of how you perform. I love you because of who you are. You're my son. And that's, the, that's how God feels about us. He loves us because of who we are. We're his children. Before we do anything for him, before you ever preach a message or lead worship or, or, or pray for somebody or share the good news of Jesus, God wants all of us to know, apart from your works, apart from what you do, I want you to know you are my beloved sons and daughters and in you I'm well pleased. I'm pleased with you because of who you are, not because of what you did, because I'm telling you I'm pleased with you before you get a chance to really go and do anything. Isn't that beautiful? And so... so You've got these moments of confirmation, this voice from the sky. You've got the dove that comes and descends. You've got this, this, this confidence that's so bold in John that he declares to the crowds, this is the dude, this is the guy. Fast forward some time, John's in prison, and I don't know why, but it says here that when John heard the works of Jesus, all of a sudden he started to second guess, is this really God? You ever have that in your own life? Be really, really confident about who God is and what God is doing and so on. Then you have a moment where you just start to second guess. Hang on, I'm not. Is this? I thought I, thought I was following God, but am I really? I thought this was God, but hang on, I'm, I'm not 100% sure now. How many of you know that children are brilliant with technology? Any, any of you know that kids are great with technology? I was up the back there this morning and I'm getting a lecture on how PowerPoint works and Word works and everything and, and I'm telling you I've, I've got a mobile phone and my mobile phone, I can send a text message, answer a text message, click on Google. And there's not many other things I can do with that. I can scan a document. I've got a couple of things I can do there. But how many of you know that mobile phones, that piece of technology in your hand, how many of you know that it can probably do way more than you think it can do? Yeah? You ever been surprised by something? One of your children go, oh, that's, you can just do this, grab that, download that app, press that button, blah, 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 and you're like, wow, it cooks chicken dinners. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Anyone ever have those moments? Let me tell you some things that uh, a mobile phones can do, and maybe you don't know this. Did you know a mobile phone can test the batteries in your remote controls at home? Did you know that? Yes, yes, you can. There you go, you've learned some. Your mobile phone, if it's a smartphone, sorry, I might be counting you out, but that's okay, that's okay, uh, that's all right. But I'm just letting you know, if you had a smartphone, here's what you're missing out on, right? You can, you can point it at your remote controls at home and you can actually test, it's true, you can test the batteries in your, and there's a way you do it, I'm not getting into that, but you can test the batteries in your remote controls. You know you can translate foreign languages with your phone. Yeah, you can translate foreign languages. You know your phone can be a metal detector. Did you know that? Amazing. You can turn your phone into a metal detector. I'm not saying you're going to strike it rich and find gold, but you can turn it, literally turn it into a metal detector. You can use your phone as a tape measure. All you tradesmen out there, forget your Stanley things. Just get a phone and go zoom, zoom, and it'll tell you how long that piece of wood is or whatever. You can turn it into a tape measure. You can turn it into a wallet. Did you know that? You can save all your cards and all your details into this little thing on your phone. Turn your phone literally into a wallet. Did you know that you can start your car with your phone? Did you know that? The technology is there. If you, with certain cars and certain downloads, you can literally start a car with your phone. Um, you know, I'm going to start your car now, Rod. You better go out there. Where's my... You can start a car with your phone. Did you know you can change the channels on your TV with your phone? With your phone, you can change the channels on the telly. Did you know you can monitor your heart rate? You can monitor your heart rate using a phone. Did you know that if a plane flies over the top of us right now, we can find out what that plane, uh, w w where that plane is going, what that plane's number is right now by using a phone? Isn't that amazing? Did you know that if you've got somebody that's flying home and you don't know the plane's late or, you know, you, you ring up and you are, is the plane on time? Everyone ever do that? Is the plane, and the plane's always late or something, especially if they're international. And instead of driving there and sitting there for three hours, you, you ring them up and they go, oh, no, plane's running late, whatever. You don't even need to do that. You can pick up your phone and put in the plane number and it'll show you where the plane's flying so you know where it is. Phones are amazing. And they can do so many Things, can't they? 
Here's the thing. The fact is, there's a lot of stuff that you don't know about the stuff that you know a lot about. Right? There's a lot of stuff that you don't know about the stuff that you know a lot about. And I think that's what's happening here with John the Baptist. At this point in John's uh, spiritual journey, he's realizing that there's probably stuff he doesn't know about the God who he knows a lot of stuff about. Because he hears what Jesus is doing, and here's the thing. Every one of us, including John, have two things in their life. We have a theological box, and that theological box gives us what I'll call an experiential bias. What do I mean by that? Our theological box is basically, this is what we believe God will and won't do. This is, this is who we believe God is, therefore this is how he operates. And because of that, we then have an experiential bias where we're open or closed to certain things. We'll call certain things God or not God because it, our theological boxes determine what uh, experiential biases we actually have in our life. I'll give you an example. If you don't believe that God heals today, let's say you have a theological box that says that, that the healing power of God is gone from the earth and God doesn't heal anymore and we'll all be totally healed one day when we get to heaven. And there are people like that. And maybe you're in this room and you believe that. That's okay. I don't believe that. You might. That's fine. One day we'll get to heaven and we can, you know, we probably won't even ask Jesus because we won't care. But I'm just saying, it's not a salvation issue whether you believe Jesus heals the sick today or not. I'm just saying, I do, I believe he does. But if you don't believe that God heals today, there's your box. Therefore, you won't be praying for the sick, you won't be receiving prayer for sick, for, for when you are sick, and you won't expect healing. So your experience is impacted by your box. Your theological box is giving you an experiential bias. You'll lean away from anything to do with healing. You just won't be a part of it. If I don't believe that there's a blessing attached to giving of tithes and offerings to God's work, if I don't believe that there's some kind of uh, blessing attached to that, that it's just not important and, and, and God doesn't require it and doesn't want it and doesn't need it, and, and if I believe that, that my money is just all mine and I can just do whatever I want with it, that's my theological box. Therefore, I probably won't give to a local church and I probably won't give to local missions or anything like that because it's my box. I just think, what's in it for me? There's nothing in it. God doesn't need it. So, so you'll be a kind of person who probably doesn't give. If you don't believe that God acts on prayer, that's your theological box. What's the point in praying? Because God is God and God will just do whatever he wants when he wants because he wants anyway. He doesn't need my little old words flying out there into the cosmos. And so if you're a person that doesn't believe uh, uh, in prayer, that prayer makes a difference, that's your theological box, then the truth is you won't spend time in prayer. And you probably won't attend prayer meetings and you probably won't be the one when someone comes in and says the tractor's not working. You probably won't be the guy to say, let's stop and let's pray right now. You won't be that person. You can see our theological boxes, what we believe about God, impacts the experiential side of our life and what we're open to or what we're close to. Oftentimes, the Holy Spirit... Let, let, let's look at John 14, 16 to 17. Have we got that there? John 14, 16 to 17. Watch this. This is what Jesus prayed about the Holy Spirit. He said, And I will pray the Father, and he'll give you another helper. Now, that word helper in the NIV, a few other versions, you would know the word as counselor, comforter. Comforter, right? The comforter. I'll pray the Father, he'll give you another helper or a comforter, that he may be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So the world can't receive the spirit of truth. It doesn't mean the spirit of truth is not in the world. It's saying the world can't receive the spirit of truth. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be what? In you. So he's saying here, he'll give you another helper. He'll give you a comforter. Now here's a reality about the comforter. We've mistaken the role of the comforter as the one who is committed to making us comfortable. We, we, we mistaken the role of the comforter. When Jesus says, I'll give you a comforter, we think that that means that he's committed, the Holy Spirit's committed to making us comfortable. And that's not what Jesus said. In fact, when I think about it logically, when do you need comforting? Most likely when in some way or sense we are feeling uncomfortable. So in the midst of uncomfortable, who's present? The comforter. The comforter. So often we think when we're uncomfortable that God's not there. If we're uncomfortable, it means that the Spirit has left the building, that God is not doing anything because I'm uncomfortable about this. Well, we all get uncomfortable at times around things that God is doing and saying and so on. John the Baptist is a little bit, I think, here uncomfortable. 
I've just made this public declaration of who Jesus is. I've put all my eggs in the Jesus basket. And now I'm hearing, what? The works of Jesus. So Jesus is doing some things that are outside my theological box and possibly my experiential bias. And as a result of that, I'm uncomfortable about that. Now Jesus says here, it's the world who cannot receive the Spirit. And so here's just a thought. I just wonder whether maybe our box, our theological box and our experiential bias, maybe they're the points, the external points where the world is still somewhat alive inside of us. And so it's hard to receive the Spirit in that part of our existence or our life. Because maybe, just maybe, just maybe we still think a little worldly. Or maybe we've still got a bit of the world alive in those spaces. And so when God gets to that point and we feel uncomfortable, it's not necessarily because the Holy Spirit is not there. Because Jesus never said that the Spirit would make you comfortable. How many of you know that comfort is, and convenience are the two number one values in Western society? If you could break down Western society, the two most valuable things in the West are comfort and convenience. That's why just about every invention that's going to come out is going to meet the need of one of those two things, if not both. It's going to make your life more comfortable or it's going to make things more convenient for you. And we've mistaken the role of the comforter as the one who's committed to making us comfortable. The Spirit is my comforter, and I need comfort when I'm feeling uncomfortable. So being uncomfortable is not a sign of the Spirit's absence. In fact, according to what Jesus said, they're the moments where, even though I feel uncomfortable, they're probably the moments where the Spirit is most active and alive and drawing the nearest to me in those moments. It's important to realize that the Holy Spirit can be very present in an environment and a situation that may cause me to feel uncomfortable. The Holy Spirit can be very alive and very real in a space where I feel somewhat uncomfortable. It's an important thing for each of us to acknowledge so that we don't switch off or resist what God wants to do inside of us, around us and through us. It's important that we acknowledge that just because I'm uncomfortable it doesn't mean the Spirit has left the building. Or just because I'm uncomfortable doesn't mean the Spirit's not here. We're, 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 we're to be led by the comforter, not led by comfort. And so many of us in our Christian lives are being led by comfort. What's comfortable? I know that because people leave churches for all kinds of, of, of reasons and, and, and maybe I'm uncomfortable with the worship. And so I'll go and find another church or I'm uncomfortable with that message. I didn't like it, so I'm just going to leave. Rather than sit in the uncomfortable space and allow the comforter to come in and sit with him. I say, I believe John the Baptist. I love what John did. He's in prison, so he couldn't physically get to Jesus, but he sent his disciples to go to him to say, hey. And how many of us in that uncomfortable moment don't go to Jesus ourselves? And we don't, instead, we just throw the baby out with the bathwater. We cast off whatever God might want to do or could be wanting to do. And my experience in my life, here's what I've found. When I get to that point of uncomfortableness, sometimes that's because God is wanting to stretch the borders of my theological box and expand the boundaries of my experiential bias. Because God is bigger than I think he is. And he's bigger than you think he is as well. We're meant to be led by the comforter, not led by comfort. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. You know, this comforter told Peter to grab a lame man by the hands and lift him to his feet. You all read that? The man at the temple gate, beautiful. You ever read that story in Acts? Yep. Walking along and they're going to the temple and this man sitting there begging and, and the comforter tells Peter, grab him by the hand after saying to him, silver and gold I don't have, what I do have I'll give you in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. And the Bible actually says this, the, the writer of Acts, Luke, he says this, that Peter grabs him by the hand, pulls him up and after he pulled him up, his feet were strengthened. It wasn't like he said, be healed in Jesus' name and the guy's feet were strong and he lifted himself up. Peter grabbed a guy and pulled a guy up. That's uncomfortable. If I'm standing there watching that, guess what? I'm uncomfortable. The comforter told Peter to get up to kill and to eat. He gave him a vision of all these, these animals that were impure for a good little Jewish boy to touch and eat and so on. And, and he says, kill and eat. And then eventually he sends him to a Gentile's house to go and preach the gospel. I'm telling you right now, in that moment, Peter's feeling pretty uncomfortable. Peter's pretty uncomfortable. 
The comforter told Stephen in Acts, I think it's 7, to, to accuse the religious leaders publicly to their faith, of kill, for their faith of killing Jesus, knowing that that then eventually led to his own death. This is the comforter telling him to look him in the eye and go, you brood of vipers, you always resist the spirit, you killed Jesus, and then he gets stoned to death. The comforter was telling him to speak this out. The comforter was there. The comforter transported Philip. In Acts chapter 9 or 8, 8 or 9, somewhere there, Philip's walking along and remember the story, there's a chariot there, Ethiopian eunuch is in there, he runs alongside the chariot and his ears dropping on this thing and here's what he's talking about, long story short, the Ethiopian eunuch sees water, says what's stopping me getting baptised, Philip says nothing, let's do it, they pull up, they get in the water, it says he puts him down and then when Philip comes up, guess what? Philip's gone. When the eunuch comes up, Philip is literally transported and he's taken about 35 kilometers away from where he was and suddenly appears in the city of Azotus. That's kind of uncomfortable. First of all, Lord, what about the follow-up? Why didn't you should have made him stay there and come up with a discipleship plan and follow up and so on? But but God moves him. If I'm Philip, I'm a little uncomfortable about that whole thing. I'm in the water up to here. Don't gonna go next thing I look up, I'm I don't know, I'm in a marketplace wherever I am, but I'm not where I was. That's kind of uncomfortable. It's kind of uncomfortable. The comforter told Paul to continue on to Rome even though chains and tribulations awaited him. The comforter told Paul to speak blindness over a sorcerer called Elimus. He's there, he's preaching the gospel. This sorcerer is getting in the way and the comforter says to him, look him in the eye and say, you're going to be blind, dude. They're going to take you around by the hand and he's blind. That's the comforter. If I'm standing there with Paul and he looks at the guy in the eye and he goes, be blinded, I'm going, oh, dude, you're going too far now. I'm walking away from most of these scenarios. I'm kind of, I'm walking away. I don't want to stand there. You ever get in those moments where you're awkward? You've got that radical for Jesus friend and they go, oh, can I tell you about Jesus? And you go, oh, I just, oh. Can I pray for you in the line at the shop? Oh, I'm just going to, oh, Mars bar's a dollar. I'm going to go. You ever have those moments? We've all had those moments, you know? Where the comfort is doing all this kind of stuff. Jesus comes to a, a, a funeral parade. Think about this, uh, Luke 7, I think. There's a funeral parade and they're carrying the, the body of the, the dead boy and the mother is weeping and Jesus moved with compassion. But I don't care whether you move with compassion or not. Don't walk up to a mother who's lost a son and say, stop weeping. He walks up and goes, don't weep. And then he takes it a step further. He walks over and he and the, it, it says he touched the coffin. Big no-no, big no-no in that culture. You know, he's just become unclean. And it says that everyone stopped. And I think it means in the Greek, it says they were all kind of beside themselves, going, what is this? What is this? Now, here's the thing. We read all those stories with this beautiful little thing called hindsight. Right? We're reading it on the other side, so what do we know that they may not have known at the time? We're 100% convinced it was what? It was God. It was God. Each one of those events, it was God. But in the moment, if we were there, we wouldn't be thinking about it 2,000 years like we do 2,000 years later. We'd be thinking different. We'd be uncomfortable. We'd be questioning whether God's in it. We'd be wanting to walk away. We'd be wanting to resist. If Paul had have said, hey, you know what? Watch this. I'm going to tell that guy to be blind. You probably would have tried to talk Paul out of it and said, Paul, don't do that. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, I know where you go. Don't tell him they're killed. Don't tell him, Stephen, don't. We'd, we'd, we probably would have tried to stop whatever God was doing and resist whatever was going on in that moment because we would be uncomfortable. But in hindsight, we know in each one of these situations, guess what? The Spirit was there and it was God. When we find ourselves uncomfortable around what God is doing, then we need to ask ourselves this question. Is this actually wrong or could God be using this to expand my box and my bias? Could God be wanting to reveal a bigger picture of who he actually is to me? Could God be wanting to reveal a bigger picture to me of who he is by expanding my theological box and pushing me outside my experiential bias? Is it possible? Ephesians 3, verse 20, 21. Paul, after speaking about how great God is and so on, I can almost picture if you read Ephesians 3, Paul, uh, uh, this being written and Paul explaining how God is great and God has given us this and he's done that and so on. And it's almost like I can picture him getting to this point and just throwing the pen in the air and going, I don't know how to describe how great God is. Gee, he's awesome. And he says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Above all you can ask or think. So I want you to think about the biggest thing you think God could do now. 
And I want to tell you that's probably the floor, it's not the ceiling, because Paul seems to know a God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. Everything we can ask, everything we He says he can do greater than that according to the power that works in us. I love that, 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 that it's God. And when we think God out there, but he says, yes, God who oversees everything, but the power to do all you can ask or think, he's placed it within reach. He's put it in you. So yeah, God, but the power that he uses, it's very accessible. It's right here. It's with us and it's within us. And he says, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Let me ask you a question. If God can do anything, if I ask you the question, can God do anything? You would say, yeah, because we're good Christians. <laughs> even, though maybe, even though maybe we've still got our theological boxes and so on and we're still questioning things, but we're all probably still going to say, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, of course he can. God can do anything. Yeah. You'd say yes. But when he does do anything, sometimes we fight against it as though God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't do that. You know? But God wouldn't do that. But you said God, God could do anything. He could. He really wouldn't do that. What do you mean he wouldn't do that? I was in a room once. Uh, sorry, it wasn't a room. It was a tent. I'm standing in a tent once. And I've shared this story before and because it, it's never left me. And I, it's like I'm standing there watching it happen yesterday. I was standing right here worshipping and I'm here like this. And I look across to the left and about one row back over there. And there's a girl standing there. And I'd known her for a while. We were doing a training school together. And she had all kinds of emotional stuff going on. She had a terrible childhood, lots of stuff. And, and counselling and all this sort of stuff to try to deal with some of that stuff. And I turned and I looked at her. And as I did, something, I don't know what it was, and it's outside my theological box at the time. Still, if I'm brutally honest, it's still outside my theological box, but I know it was God. You know why? Because in hindsight. Something picked that girl up. I watched her fly through the air, three rows of chairs. Sounds weird. She was picked up, three rows of chairs, landed with the small of her back on the top of the chair. Went like a pretzel, snapped, bounced forward, landed in the mud, because we were in a tent outside, landed in the mud, the dirt, burst into uncontrollable laughter and was instantly set free of so much emotional baggage. I don't understand it, I don't get it, but I continued a training school with her, went to India with her for six months. She was transformed. There was no faking it. She was a totally, utterly different person. Now, God, why did you do that for her? Why am I still seeing counsellors and therapists to try to unpack my baggage? I just, God, just here, throw me over a chair right now. I'd be happy for it to happen, and it's all over in a minute, but he didn't do that with me, but he did it with her. I don't know why. So when I tell people about that, well, God can do anything. I'll be, God wouldn't do that. Well, okay, so he wouldn't do anything. So there's, there, there's a box. God wouldn't do something like that. Look, at the end of the day, here's the thing. I've got hindsight because I know the transformation and the change and what happened in her life. I know the fruit of it. So God can do anything. Yes, does that mean that, you know, God's not going to go outside the boundaries of his word and his character as revealed in his word. But let me tell you something. Those boundaries are way wider than you or me give him credit for. Those boundaries are way wider than you and me are comfortable with. Way wider than what we are comfortable with. Last week, um, I had a person come to me uh, after the service. We were just having a chat during the week. And they told me that they were a bit uncomfortable with what was happening last week in the service. Those of you that were here, uh, wasn't, I didn't think it was, was, was weird, but I understand we all get uncomfortable around certain things. And last week, we had several people here that would testify and tell you that they felt like the Holy Spirit did something in their life. And sometimes, when the Holy Spirit is doing something, sometimes, yep, there's visible manifestations and things. And, you know, some people might uh, shake a little bit, some people might fall down, all that sort of stuff. We've seen it all over the years and, and you know, been through it and so on. Everyone in this room has experienced that stuff. And you've probably seen a lot of fake stuff as well. Uh, but, but, but there's real stuff in there too. I mean, I can open up, I didn't want to do it, but I could go through page after page of this word and show you where the Bible tells you that people tremble in the presence of God. I can show you where, 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 when the glory of God filled the temple, when Solomon dedicated the temple and the glory fell, everybody, the whole of Israel, fell on their faces, melted. I can tell you, I've had experiences myself. The scripture says we melt like wax in the presence of God. I had an experience like that one night. I woke up and I went to go to the toilet and it was about two in the morning. I walked around the foot of my bed and as I did, this light just shone above my bed. I can't explain it and it was outside my theological box. And if I'm honest, it still is because I'm not a very emotional person. But I know what happened. This light shone and I looked and the minute I looked at it, I literally collapsed. All strength left my body. I fell face first onto the bed and the the scripture came into my mind that the hills melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. And as quick as it happened, all of a sudden, it was over. And I had to pick myself back up and I didn't worry about the toilet. I went back to bed laying there going, what was that? What was that? 
But see, if we have a heart to go deeper with God and to grow in our relationship with God, what we need to understand is that, that God will push us to the edges of our theological boxes and our experiential biases because the, they're the spaces that he wants to get us outside of in order to give us a bigger picture and a greater revelation of who he is and what he's capable of and what he can do. Last week, somebody gave me a word, those of you that were here, and, and said to me, you know, uh, I feel like you should run through and lay hands on people and impart faith to people. Now, those of you that have been with us for the last eight years, you know I've never done that. I don't finish the service and run around praying for people. I was uncomfortable doing it, but guess what? It was a word from God that came to me in a moment to go and do it. And so at the end of the service, I, I walked up to many of you and said, would you mind if I pray for you? Yes, it was odd. Yes, it was weird. Do you think I wasn't uncomfortable? You're kidding yourself. I was very uncomfortable. But, but... I'm looking here going, God, is there any reason why it wouldn't be you? Was there a witness in my spirit that this could be God? Yeah. So I'm going to step out and do some of that stuff. When I speak on evangelism, especially when I speak on the power of God, the question I get the most from people is this. Why doesn't God do things like that here in the West? These kids go on overseas mission trips. Anyone been overseas on a mission trip? And you see what God does in those places. And you see the power of God and you see healings and deliverances, all kinds of things in these other places. And I constantly get the question from people back here in the West, why doesn't God do it here? Now, my first answer is he does. I've seen it, been a part of it, experienced it. He does do that stuff back here. But I understand what you're saying. Why does it just seem to happen so freely that God gets to move that way over there, but he doesn't here? And I wonder, I wonder whether... Deep down inside, some of us have this idea. And we know that because we, we see God, and it's almost like it's okay, God can do that there, but he can't here. I wonder whether some of us have this vision of God and the enemy that they have a much more diplomatic relationship here in the West. They're, much more, they're, they're, they're on better diplomatic terms here. Over there, they hate each other's guts, and they rip each other apart, and they fight, and all the sort of, you know, they just don't get on over there, and that's why you see people getting delivered and healed, and, and they're just tussling for power and fighting and so on. It's not really a tussle. God wins all the time. But we see all that, and then we come over here, and they come to the West. Well, they adopt Western diplomacy. And so before we do anything in this meeting, we're going to sit, we're going to have a chat. We're going to work it out first. Are you okay? No? Okay, well, what about you? Okay, no worries. Well, let's just work out our boundaries before we... Like, seriously, it's okay over there, and we see it over there, but then we get uncomfortable when God starts moving by his spirit in the lives of people here in the West, especially when it goes outside of our theological boxes and outside of our, our mental constraints. But you know what? The truth is, the truth is that maybe, maybe, we don't get to see God move like he does in some of these other places because maybe we care too much about our own dignity, control, and comfort. And maybe we have this mentality that God cares more about our dignity, control, and comfort here than he does there too. So go crazy over there, but be really respectful when you come here. When you go to the West, be really, really respectful. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird. Now, here's the thing. I want to finish with this. I'll get the news out. I don't want you guys to come back up because we're gonna, I want to finish with that, that second song, that new song that you taught us. Can we do that? Yep, we're going we're to finish with that. Here's, here's, here's the reality. Manifestations don't bring the presence of God. Ever been in a meeting where people are just carrying on stupid and you're just looking at it going, that's just not... You're discerning something. There's just a whole bunch of... I've been in meetings, I've been in meetings where the preachers have told had this one guy in this thing we were in and, and he's in the corner screaming and shrieking and rolling around like it was a demonic manifestation and the preacher actually looked at him and said, that's disgusting. You're in the flesh. Get up, would you? And he stopped and got up. I was like, okay. This guy had a bit of a history of, you know, if I shake, rattle and roll, people will notice me and they'll look at me and I'll... They'll think God's doing something. And, and some people are like that, yes. And there are some people in the church, and you know, you've been prayed for. Never had anyone push you before? Ever had anyone shove you over? Yeah? Yeah? I have. I used to, I used to, I, and by the way, if you do pray for me, don't push me. Because I don't care who you are, I'm going to resist you. All right? Okay? I've had, I, I, when I was in Wildwin, we had some preachers, they want to push everybody. And I would do this, I'd put my right foot back and push forward on them. If they were smart, they'd quickly pull the hand away, I wouldn't smack on my face. And they could have claimed victory in God anyway. But here's the thing. We've all seen that kind of stuff. Manifestations don't bring the presence of God, but the presence of God will bring manifestations at some point. At some point when God turns up and, 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 and go back to this collection of ancient documents and have a look. When the presence of God... The presence of God is everywhere. Who knows that? But there are moments where the presence of God is, is manifest and more tangible. Otherwise, why would Moses say? Remember Moses had this discussion with God. He was going to go somewhere. And he said to God, I'm only going to go, we'll only go if your presence goes with us. Well, hang on. You know that Moses, that God's presence is everywhere. 
But there was something about this manifested presence of God that he said, no, no, we want that. We want that. And we see time and time again in the Word of God when that manifested presence of God chooses to fall in a place or upon a person that, yeah, there's some kind of reaction can take place. And many of us get really, really uncomfortable with that. And I'll be the first one to say, I'm, I'm still a very uncomfortable person around a lot of that stuff. But see, our role here as leaders and pastors is not to control what God does, it's to steward. It's to steward what God is doing. And last week, that's what we did. We just felt we stewarded something that the Holy Spirit wanted to do. And we're not surprised by that because we've been preaching about the Holy Spirit for nearly 10 weeks now. It's just been something that's been on our hearts and a journey that we've been on. In fact, I go back and look at the history of Arise nearly every year. We do nearly a six to eight week series on the Holy Spirit. I don't know why, but I went back and had a look. It always seems to be coming up, the, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I'm very confident about our Arise community, that we'll never be a community that seeks after manifestations to prove the presence of God. I'm very confident. You're all down to earth, people that love the Lord, that are real. I'm not, ex- I'm not looking around the room seeing anybody here that's going to try to you know, fake and, 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 and make and think that it's a way of making you look spiritual. So I'm very confident in stewarding the presence of God in this place as God begins to do what he wants to do. But we do have to be careful of the opposite end of the spectrum. Don't become a person who rejects all manifestations of God's presence. Don't be people who think every time something might happen that's outside your theological box, it's not God. Or outside your experiential bias, that it isn't God. Listen to the words of Jesus when he explained to John's disciples the message that they were to take back to John in prison. Matthew 11 again, we'll finish with this, verse 4 to 6. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. He said, The blind see. See, God's in the business of helping us see things we wouldn't otherwise see. He says, The lame walk. God's in the business of getting us up and running again. Some of us need that. Lepers are cleansed. God's in the business of healing the sick. He's in the business of giving dignity for those people who through life circumstances feel like they don't have any. That's what God does. That's what he's into. The deaf hear. He opens our ears to hear things we haven't heard before. Some of us need to hear, you're my beloved son, you're my beloved daughter, and in you I'm well pleased. Some of you need to hear that. I could preach it from the front a million times in a year, but there's something special when God drops that into you, when God opens your ears, and when God speaks that into your spirit. God can do in one word and in one moment what a million church services will not do for you in an entire lifetime. And I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for a rise, not to just be a place where we give information about God. That's never what we started out with. I'm not, we don't want to just throw out information. We want the Spirit of God to impart something. We want people to be open to the Holy Spirit. Everyone's journey is going to be different, and every message on a Sunday can have a thousand applications, and the Holy Spirit knows what you need. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. He says the dead are raised up. God's in the business of bringing new life to those who've lost it. Those that once had hope, maybe once had vitality in their spiritual life, once were running hard and fast for God, but maybe you've slowed down. God wants to breathe life back into that. Or maybe you've never known Jesus at all. Maybe you've never come into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've sat in church your whole life. Maybe you've ridden on the faith of your parents. Maybe you've ridden on the faith of your movement or your denomination or your pastor or something else. Maybe you've never, ever made that decision to step across. Well, God's in the business of getting you across that line. And watch this. He says, and blessed is he who is not, what? Offended because of me. He says, blessed is he who is not offended. He lists all these things. It's almost like he's saying, he's saying, although, he says, go back and say this to John, although you are hearing about me, maybe outside your theological box and your experiential bias, don't be offended by it. In other words, don't allow what I'm doing, even though it makes you uncomfortable, become a stumbling block for you. I have a theological box and an experiential bias. I know I do. And I know every time God pushes on those boundaries and I sit with him and I listen to him and I get into his word, every time I do, my intimacy with him grows, my ability to hear him grows, and my availability to be used by him grows. So I just want to throw that out to us this morning, something for us to think about, because I do believe we're coming into days where the world is not so much interested in hearing what you have to say, it wants to see what we've got. 
Paul said, when I came to the Corinthians, he said, I didn't come with wise and persuasive words of human wisdom. So I came in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men. But I want your faith to rest in the power of God because God is eternal. God is the one you put your faith in. God is the one that's with you in the deepest, darkest moments of your life. God is the one that sees what nobody else sees. God can say what no one else can say. God can show you what nobody else can show you. And we need our faith in God. Just close your eyes for me for a second. Here's what we're going to do. Anybody in this room right now, you have never given your life to Jesus. You have never opened up your heart and fully surrendered your life to him. And you're sitting here and you're hearing about this God and you're realizing, you know what, I've got a box and maybe a bias and and maybe my box doesn't even let God inside of it. If that's you this morning, I'm just going to ask you once. If that's you this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus, you'd like to give your life to him right now. I'm just going to ask you, just raise your hand. Just put your hand in the air for me. I'm not going to bring you up the front. I'm not going to embarrass you. What we're going to do now is we're going to worship. We're going to, we're going to play this song. We're going to worship. If you need to leave, you're free to go. If you'd like to grab a tea or a coffee up the back, feel free to do that. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to open up the front here. We would love to pray for people this morning. We would love to pray for you. If you've got stuff going on in your world, we want to stand with you in faith and believe in a God that can. A God that can. All things are possible. A God that can change things. You might have stuff going on in your heart. You might be sick this morning. We believe in a God that heals and we want to pray for you. You may feel like there's stuff. Uh, some, some people here, some people live life feeling like there's this hook in their back. And, you know, we, we, we say we're free, but we know that we can only go to here and then we feel something pulling us back. Ever, anyone ever experienced that? Might be in worship, might be at work, in your workplace, might be, might be in your relationship with God, might be in your relationship with your husband, your wife, your children. You know who you want to be, you know who you should be, but you can only go so far before something pulls you back. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for some of that stuff to be broken over people's lives this morning so you can charge into being who you're meant to be and do everything that God has called you to do. So we're just going to worship now. We're going to open up the front. If you'd like prayer, feel free to come forward. Uh, Feel free to pray with one another in your seats. Do that. If you want tea and coffee, feel free to grab that as well. Just respect what's going on with people up here. Uh, Let me just quickly pray for us. Then be free, be released, and, and, and head off in whatever direction you want to head. But Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. God, we thank you for the power of your word. And Lord, as we've sung, we thank you for the power of the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, things on earth, things above the earth, Lord, things future, past, God, all things. God will bow to the name of Jesus. There is no greater power than the power of God in the earth today, Father. So we thank you, Lord, for that, God. And I pray for everybody here, God. Everybody in this place, Holy Spirit, would you continue to draw us deeper and deeper into intimacy with the Father? Would you draw us deeper into the plans and the purposes of God? Would you reveal to us more and more the the everlastingness, the importance of that spiritual side of life? And reveal to us, God, just one day all this other stuff will fade. Rust, moth, it's going to destroy And the only thing that's got to be left is our relationship with you and the way that we have allowed that relationship to impact those around us. So, Father, do a work in your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen, Amen.